Hello, everybody out there. So we are very fortunate today to be speaking with two very important members of Jester King Brewery. For those of you who watch or listen to or read Craft Commander, you know Jester King is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite breweries in the world. Some of my favorite people in the world, especially in the brewing industry. Um, fortunate enough to spend some time with these, these guys in Austin and Tampa and all over the place. And now we finally have them here on the site for you guys' enjoyment. Avery and Sean, how are you doing? Good. Hi, Marco. So we're sitting here, and you guys have beautiful barrels behind you. And I see a big palette of Witchmaker, which is an amazing beer that I love. I think we'll talk about it a little more in the future of this interview. But um, I kind of want to talk about this before it starts to get warm. I already have it, and I'm getting impatient, and then we'll start with the interview, but I'm drinking Figlet, um, which is really, really, really cool. I didn't know how all the smoked figs would play with kind of your guys' house culture. It's very acidic, uh, and I, I just love it. I, you, you guys mind talking about this beer a little bit? Kind of, I think it's a great, a great way to kind of segue into food and beer, uh, because it's a collaboration with a restaurant, and you're using some you know, different fruits and things like that in the beer. So maybe talk through the beer a little bit. Uh, so Figwood is a beer that we did in collaboration with Franklin Barbecue here in Austin, Texas. Um, Aaron is a good friend of the brewery and makes some of the best brisket on the planet. Um, and just like we have a house culture here at the brewery and the beers that we make, he kind of has a pit culture in the barbecue that he makes, right? So we wanted to do a collaboration with him we, didn't, we had already done smoked beers and that we had another barbecue place smoke some malt for us. Um, we've done a few other smoked beers as well, but with Figlet, we wanted to approach it from kind of a different angle. Um, you know, we love fruit here at Jester King. We use a lot of fruit in our fermentations. We had not used figs previously, so we thought, you know, figs might, you know, they're kind of meaty, kind of sweet, kind of, you know, juicy. We wanted kind of meat-like to begin with, right? Uh, so we thought that, that might be a good way to go. So we had Aaron smoke, pull smoke, and char some figs for us. Uh, so we made a beer, darker grist, um, something fairly simple, and then we added those smoked and charred figs post-primary fermentation. Um, I haven't had that beer in a little while. I know the last time I tried it, it was really, really tasting pretty great. Um, so it's done very well with age. Um, like with most of our beers, I would imagine that it's picked up some acidity in the bottle. Um, but like yeah, one. yeah. The beer was this is batch one. Oh, oh nice. wow! Yeah. Nice. September 11, 2014. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's tasting awesome. It's it like I was talking to Sean beforehand, and you pick up the smoke still, and I was like, you know, I, I didn't really, I, I knew it was figs, but I forgot it was smoked figs, and I was like, where's the smokiness coming from? That's awesome. Yeah. And it's like, duh, idiot! It's smoked figs in there, and so. Um, <laughs> Of leather, and when we first brewed it, we were tasting it out of the tank, and I remember it tasting a lot like poblano pepper, like charred poblanos. Sweet pepper. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's right when you pop the bottle, and here's the here's the beer. It's a really beautiful, like amberish, reddish color. But right when you pop the uh, the bottle, you smell like, oh, this is Jester King. Um, you're talking about your house culture. It's an amazing thing. We're gonna get into a little more detail a little bit, but. I just I love the fact that when I smell a beer that's made by Jester King, I know it's made by Jester King. And when I drink a beer with Jester King, I know there's that underlying house character. And you guys are, I mean, one of the breweries that does that the best. And I want to get into how, why that is. You're probably going to be modest and not acknowledge that. But um, it's just really cool. And I, any collaboration you guys do, I always go, geez, this is like, this is Jester King. <laughs> this is like, you know, it's a collaboration. Um, but... I guess before we get into that, I want to talk about you guys a little bit. The last time we uh, spoke with, I guess, Jester King, it was with Jeff. Um, so you guys bring a different perspective, and I really love that. And Jeff actually recommended I speak with you guys. He wanted to hear what you guys had to say. And, um, so maybe well, you guys can just take that on yourselves, you know, wh whoever goes first, and kind of like what you do at the brewery, how you got to the brewery, a little bit of that. All right. I'll go first. Um, I, my kind of beer journey started as a home brewer, uh, making beer at home, getting interested in beer and wanting to make styles that 
tried before. Um, I worked at a homebrew store in Houston for quite some time, a place called DeFalco's. And then from there, I uh, got my first opportunity to work in a brewery in Houston. From there, I went, I worked at a, a brewery in Houston called Buffalo Bayou, and I went to work at a brewery called Eight Wonder. Uh, but the beers that I was making at home, the beers that I was interested in making, were always mixed cultural beers, or very dry beers with some acidity, uh, mostly Saison, uh, so just like, you know, making what I wanted to drink all the time to it warm down here. So, um, I was bugging Jeff and Ron for a while and just kind of like pushing some of my, you know, the greatest hits of the homebrew on them to make sure, you know, they, they tried some. And uh, I volunteered on some packaging days here, I think back in uh, 2011, uh, about five years ago now. Uh, and then after they heard that I was working at some other breweries and maybe uh, wasn't, you know, making the beer that I really wanted to be making, uh, they gave me awesome opportunity to come on. I started here in October of last year. So I'm still in the I think much, but yeah, it's been it's been great working here. Cool. Yeah. What about you, Avery? <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Avery Swanson. I've been here at Jester King for about three and a half years now. Um, I started out here volunteering actually. I had also been a home brewer for a couple of years. Um, I come from a a science background, I guess. I was doing clinical research down in Houston for a little while and hated working in a hospital. So uh, moved to Austin, had been kind of just putzing around, not really doing a whole lot, homebrewing a lot. Um, and I reached out to Jester King um, beginning of, or towards the end of 2012, I guess. And um, they let me come out here for a few packaging days. Basically any day that they let me out, I, I was out here um, so after volunteering for about six months, I started a full-time apprenticeship and did that for about six months. Um, and they brought me on full-time as a brewer and, uh, did that for some time. I'm still a brewer, um, but I'm also the packet or the production manager here now as well. So I'm kind of steering the ship in a sense. Uh, Garrett is our head brewer. Um, he focuses a lot on recipe development, um, but as far as like scheduling and Barrel stuff goes. I'm kind of at the helm there these days. So pretty exciting stuff. Got a lot of projects um, that have been going on in the background for a few years now that are kind of finally coming to fruition, um, and you know new projects in the pipeline as well. So pretty exciting time to be here. Super dynamic time. Mm -hmm. um, excited for the rest of the year and the following year to come. So. Yeah, you guys have had a huge year. Um, yeah. and it's, it's been <laughs> Yeah. It's been awesome to watch it, um, and we're going to get into the kind of what types of things have been going on, but <clears throat> as production manager, you know, what's interesting to me is that a lot of these beers kind of do what they will, and they're ready, as John Van Roy says, where the beer tells me when it's ready, and, and so it, your job becomes kind of priceless. <laughs> I mean, how do, how do you... How do you begin to manage something that is so, well, I mean, I guess it's not so unpredictable, but it's not as predictable as brewing an amber, an IPA, and a brown every week or every other week. Yeah. And knowing when it's going to be ready. Um, how, how do you manage making sure people get beer? And, and, and I guess part two to that is I know you guys don't distribute a whole lot. Yeah. Well, I was at the brewery, so I guess that may help you with, with that a little bit, but you still got to keep a steady pipeline of beer going. So how, how does that kind of process go for Jessica? Um, very carefully, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's definitely like trying to put together a puzzle where the pieces are changing to put them into place. So you gotta, I mean, honestly, I'm a pre type A kind of OCD type person and like to have plans and like to have things kind of I don't want to say I like to be in control, but I certainly like to know what's going to happen and have a basic idea as to what's going on. Um, but here we're working, obviously our mixed culture um, has a mind of its own and does what it does. And we are here as stewards and as hosts to this, this culture, you know, we work in symbiosis with it. So if a fermentation, you know, decides, decides that it needs longer, um, you know, then we'd have to kind of accommodate that. And honestly, for the most part, we don't have too many major issues. Um, you know, our the managing partners here at Jester King are really great in that they understand that 
the nature of the beast. They know that we can't make a whole lot of beer all the time. Uh, quality over quantity is very much, you know, our, our MO and they understand and are very patient with us, which is great. Um, that being said, you know, we have expanded the barrel room over the past year and a half. So we've spent a lot of time filling oak in this room. Um, packaging tends to speed up towards, towards the summertime. So it's very seasonal and kind of comes in waves. You know, wintertime we have spontaneous season and we can talk a little bit more about that in depth in a bit. Um, but spontaneous season, and that's all we do for weeks, you know, is spontaneous stuff. Lots of barrel work, lots of really intense brew days. Um, some packaging, but not as much. And then we kind of move into like post spawn season where we do much more barrel work, kind of, you know, packaging of funk metal, brewing of funk metal, refill those barrels and RU55 and all of these, uh, you know, barrel aged blends or brands. 100%. Yeah, 100% barrel aged blends. Um, and then we kind of move into springtime and it's fruit season. And that's kind of where it feels like we're right in the middle of it, but I guess we're, we're kind of season. wrapping up some of the fermentations that we did in the beginning of the spring, starting some of these later spring, early summer uh, fermentations. So lots of fruit. Most of what's in the tank in, in the brewery right now is fruit stuff. So you just kind of learn how to ebb and flow with what goes on. Some beers like to ferment when it's warmer here too. Uh, we're able to make, you know, the beers mm. we have around all the time with petite plants. We have that in tanks right now. Yeah. Um, which the yeast wouldn't perform nearly as good if we were pitching it when it's 40 degrees outside right. rather than today's about 100 degrees yeah. or something here. Uh, and those beers, the yeast is uh, a lot happier uh, for fermenting these things when it gets warmer. So that's a part of our seasonality. And also mm -hmm. only being able to make the spontaneous, uh, brew the spontaneous work uh, and fill our cool ship during the winter time, which is also very short here, uh, cold nights mm -hmm. here this year. But. So are you are you so you're fermenting in Petite Prince, for example, now in stainless? Is, are you guys fermenting in like glycol jacketed stainless or is it ambient temperature stainless? No, they're all glycol jacketed, um, so we can cool things down in the summertime, but we don't really have a way to warm things up in the winter, um, which also kind of results in this more seasonal brewing schedule that we have. Um, I mean, it's super hot here in Austin, and we would be making vinegar in no time if we <laughs> waited to cool those tanks down. Similarly, like our groundwater um, here gets very, very warm as well. We're pulling all of our water from a well. Mm -hmm. So when it's 100 degrees outside and it's 100 degrees for weeks at a time, that well water is very, very warm. So we can't even really, yeah. there's no coolness here. It's very <laughs> hot. <laughs> we, we wait for it and then we, we embrace it. And, yeah. and then we, we take advantage of it when we have it. Uh, <laughs> just like the warm weather too. Uh, for when it gets warmer, we're able to make some really, really cool. Uh, so I guess as your yeast strain has evolved, you've, got, you've probably come to know it a lot better, you know, as it's evolved, maybe you, you can even tame it more. It, is that true? I mean, are you guys getting a predictability on how long it's going to take you to get a beer ready with your yeast culture? Um, yeah. Um, you know, as we have co-evolved with this culture, we do know, you know, out of just observable phenomenon that if we change the temperature a little bit, we can get this, this reaction out of the culture. If we add a little bit more hops, we can get this reaction out of it. So, there are plenty of variables that we can play with to achieve that end result. And as far as timing and stuff goes, you know, a lot of the brew beers we have brewed before, so I can kind of go back in, in the logs and look at how long was this beer in tank last year? Did we do it around the same time? What can I expect the performance of the culture to be? And um, though it won't be exact and we kind of factor in that, you know, that elasticity in the schedule, uh, it's, it's fairly, it's fairly predictable. Um, yeah, it's fairly yeah. predictable. It's probably as good as it's going to get. But yeah. when it comes to uh, yeah, yeah, on certain things, certain years, yeah. the, the warmer stainless fermented. So you guys, you, I mean, the yeast strains you guys started with were, you know, you guys were using, I think, uh, like thirty-seven eleven, the French saison yeast for some beers. I think you guys were using like a British ale yeast for some other beers. I don't know how I know this stuff. It's kind of like, I can't even remember my own social security number. Oh, 
mystery. Yeah. Um, but now it's evolved to where the point where all your beers are using the same house culture, right? Mm -hmm. Or no? Yes, correct. Is, so basically the variation in, in flavors coming from, you know, your malt background, the, the grist, and whatever fruit you throw into the beer potentially. Or temp, are you varying temperatures a lot and things like that, like you were saying? Factors, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's like the constant would be a water and then the yeast. And even the water is not constant that's because true. we're pulling from a well. So, that's true. you know, whereas we were in a drought for many years, as of last year, the year before, you know, and our water was super hard. We've had a lot of rain this, this past spring and winter, so the water isn't as hard. It's still coming up through straight limestone, so it's still it's got tons of pretty high alkalinity, um, but the water changes all the time, too. And that's something that, you know, we don't alter the chemistry of it at all. We try, you know, we drink it as it comes out, you know, the raw water, we drink it just to kind of see what it tastes like so that if there is some kind of strange thing going on, we can catch it before we use a whole lot. Um, but for the most part, that's the biggest change and the greatest way that we tie our product into the place here. The water. Yeah. But the yeast culture is a, is a cool way you guys kind of created that, or the mixed culture you guys use. It's kind of cool way you created that, and that's a sense of place in itself, right? I mean, no one's – I mean, maybe you can take some of the dregs out of a bottle and try and recreate it at home, but it's never going to be the same as what you guys are doing on the farmhouse in Austin. Um, so that – I mean, that, that in itself – and that's something that's super important to you guys too is that sense of place. And we talked about it a little bit in Tampa. We – at the uh, Food Over Thought event. So it's a good segue. Look at that. Look, It's like I meant to have it go that way. Um, a sense of place is a really important thing for you guys. And I, For me, it, it's 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 going to set people apart nowadays. And, and I have this – I go on my soapbox now, but I have this, like, theory that you either have to start off as a massive national brand these days or you've got to be a place tapped into your locality like you guys where people drive to you from the city and it's you're supplying a local demand uh, otherwise you're kind of like lost in the middle and you're gonna get kicked out of the tap handles you're in the middle of this distribution mess and it's a disaster like your goal should be making beer for you and the people around you your community mm -hmm. your neighborhood your city mm -hmm. and not when this brewery was started or what you thinking oh you can't make wait to make beer and send yeah. it to you know, Japan, or France, or yeah. Dallas. I don't know, probably Dallas. Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> so far. But I, I, you know, I love that. And I love that we're getting back to that sense. I think, I think it was, yeah, it was actually Jeff that said it. Everyone's coming, we're coming back to this sense of butcher, baker, brewer in neighborhoods. And it's an amazing kind of thing that we're getting back to. Do you guys have some sort of um, weighing sense of responsibility that you guys are taking this on? You're like, we want to be, we want to be we want to be Austin. We want to be Texas, Austin Hill Country. We want to be this place for these people. Is there anything that weighs on you for saying this is this is we want you know maybe you're not seeking to be the representative of the city, but in saying that you're representing the city, a representative of what the city offers. Any any kind of weight on your shoulders for that, or is it just kind of we just want to brew great beer? I think it's mostly just we want to brew yeah. great beer. There are a lot of really awesome breweries yeah. here in Austin, Texas. And, uh, it's it's one of my favorite beer communities because like everybody's so close and like welcoming yeah. of each other. Um, and I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, we do something that's really unique from other breweries in this city. Um, it's a you know it's a, it's kind of our thing that we do. We have another brewery here uh, that we really like that makes just uh, German and. and Czech styles called Live Oak. Uh, so they're doing like they they do their thing. And then we have some friends that started a brewery on the east side of Austin called Blue Owl, where they do uh, kettle kettle soured beer. Uh, only kettle soured beer is what they're making. They're putting it in cans, and so they've kind of got their thing. And it's you know there's so much room to kind of carve out your own uh, like your own space in the city when it comes to like the beer scene. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're representative. At, you know, at all in, in trying to say that we re represent Austin in, in its entirety when it comes to beer or anything else. But we do want to be representative of our place here and our land out here uh, that we have and the beer that we make. 
So I, I love the concept, but why is it so important for you guys? Is there you guys have an answer for that? It's a beautiful concept. Um, it's traditional. It's but but why why is it so important? And there's a lot of breweries opening up that are doing this, and it's it's really awesome to watch. And it goes back to again when I when I smelled this and when I started tasting this, it's like yes, that's Jester King. And so it's it's great for a consumer to be able to do that. I think you know I can see got a Jester King beer, and I I know that I'm gonna enjoy it. You know I know that this is gonna have this certain characteristic to it that I really love. But as a brewer, you know I guess what is it about that that is that's so important to you guys as brewers? I don't know. I it's definitely multifaceted. You know I and I say this all the time, so I'm sure Sean probably think I'm a broken record, but like. The beer industry and the brewing industry in general is such this amazing intersection of like art and science and people. And it is this, no matter what kind of beer you're making, right? If you're making IPAs or if you're doing like, you know, Pilsners or whatever, if you're making clean, clean beer, it can still very much be that. What we're doing here at Jester King and I don't know, for me, it's very much a reflection of a time and a place and a people. So it's more than just the art, the science, and the people. It's also like a time, it's space time. I think Garrett space would appreciate time. if I said yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, so it's definitely, you know, we're creating vintages of beer, like the, especially with the spontaneous it's stuff that we're doing. Thing. It's a yeah. sentimental product to us right. and to other people as well. I don't know. I think it's really cool. It's kind of like a time capsule. You know, you open a bottle and it, it elicits a memory we're all suckers for time nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the I don't want to live in the present, yeah. so <laughs> we're just going to exist in my memory. <laughs> it is pretty. I mean, look, I'm, this is like totally romantic, but you know, go, just showing up at the brewery and walking around the brewery and going into the barrel room, going upstairs and walking above the barrels, seeing some of the cellar beers, you know, seeing Sean growing, you know, vegetables and fruits out back. Um, it, it, it's a really, it's a beautiful thing, you know, I, I kind of felt, found myself like, geez, I really have to leave now. Um, Come back. Yeah, I'm dying. <laughs> I would love home. Um, that's kind of what, you know, a thing that we're trying to do is that you came out here, you got the, you know, you experience. You created that associative memory. You know, on yourself. So when you when you drink that at home, it kind of ties into that going back to the nostalgia, the back. sentimental, the romantic thing. Yeah, it yeah. brings you back, so you can, you know. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna make me have one tear fall out of the. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what though? You know what though? In all honesty, you know that uh, Sean and I, when we were there, he uh, pulled out a bottle of Petit Prince, green bottle Petit Prince. And I'll always remember that beer, man. So thank you for that experience. It was awesome uh, to share that with you there and to walk around the property with you. And it was just such a great experience. And I, I love the fact that you go to Jester King. It's not just, you know, I'm going to drink a good beer today, but it's a, it's a whole just thing, you know, it's, it's like its own thing and it's a beautiful thing. So, and so I, during the weekends, our, our tasting rooms open Friday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday every weekend. Um, there are people that come out uh, that live in Austin, that might live in apartment complexes or in the city. And, and so for them to be able to come out here, we have a lot of like, regulars and a lot of locals that come out here just to enjoy their day, bring their kids or their dog, or just have a nice day outside, drinking or not drinking. You know, uh, we like to be able to provide that for people. So, well, it's, it's yeah. working, and it's uh, look there. There it comes. No, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> you are, <bro. laughs> so, uh, so, what was I gonna say? In that comment I just made, I mentioned the green bottles. Oh yeah, green bottles. Um, that's something you guys are experimenting with. Uh, I know that, like for Petit Prince, you're still doing the like amber bottles and green bottles, right? Um, mm -hmm. what first there's a big debate about green bottles and guys like Bob Sylvester out, out in front, you know, fighting about green bottles, but Bob's the man. <laughs> Bob is the man. Yeah. He's, he's very passionate about his green bottles. So, uh, <laughs> what about those green bottles? Why? 
why why the need for the green bottles um a couple of reasons um you know many of us kind of grew up in our young beer lives drinking saison dupont right like a few years back before they started importing only amber colored bottles they would bring everything over here in in green and so a lot of us grew up drinking that saison um many other bottles as well from uh, Belgium and France, farmhouse breweries over there that were making Saison and, and, you know, sending them over here in green bottles. So it was certainly, again, the nostalgic thing where it, it reminded us of drinking beer when we were young, young drinkers, you know, way back in the day. Uh, <laughs> but, and, you know, Garrett too, our head brewer is a huge fan of Phantom, um, probably the biggest fan of Phantom. And, Phantom uh, fan. Phantom fan, yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> and many of Danny's bottles are, if not all, are green. So it was just kind of like a thing where it's like, we really enjoyed that. Like that Euro skunk, we called it Euro skunk when we first started this conversation. Uh, really enjoyed that character in a lot of those beers. And uh, so we were like, you know, why don't we just experiment and see how putting some of our bottles in it goes. Uh, and uh, so we started doing some of that and we ended up really liking the some of the beers, um, Petite Prince, Prince especially, uh, Noble King as well. What else? Collaborations, Collaborations beer. beer. Yeah. Um, so we'll definitely we'll still continue packaging things in green bottles, um, though people like to argue about it for whatever reason. Um, you know, we do both, so you don't have to drink it in green bottles if you don't want to. It is voluntary. Um, for the most part, I guess. And we distribute a small amount of the beer, like you said before, mm -hmm. that, that we produce a very small amount of that beer. None of the green bottles have gone into distribution. No. Other than one beer, uh, Phantom Delray collaboration that we did. The beer that we don't talk about. We're not going to talk about that. No, we're not going to talk about that. Right I'd love to talk about that beer. <laughs> you too. Later. Later. We'll be the next segment. So that was a green bottle that did go out intentionally, but most of like, the petite prints, we're keeping it here. It's kept in the dark until basically it's put in your hands when you're mm -hmm. buying it at our bottles to go station. Skunked on sight. Yeah, well, it's kind of up to the consumer whether they want to take it home and put it on the windowsill and leave it there for a week, or they want to put it in their dark case and put it in their car and then put it in their dark fridge and drink it. You know, um, or my favorite thing, I still do this um, when we have it, is getting one of each and trying mm -hmm. them side by side. Yeah, um, that's always a good thing. You know, fun thing to do. What are some of the things you're noticing from the green bottles versus the amber bottles? You definitely get some of the skunk light strike character, but yeah. um, I don't find that offensive. Honestly, I kind of really enjoy it. You have, uh, yeah, like I said, you have control over too, like yeah. you, how you're storing that and how intense you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I get uh, like I don't know, maybe it's just me, but like maybe that enhances some of the yeast character because every time I have a green bottle next to a brown bottle, mm -hmm. I feel like Maybe I'm thinking mostly Petit Prince right now when I'm talking about this, but I, I think it goes for the other beers as well. Um, just kind of pushing that yeast character a little forward. Maybe that's like the light smoke character blending with it. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, yeah. I really enjoy the green. Yeah. Um, any green option, like I'll go for the green option here yeah. personally. And honestly, like the skunky stuff kind of blows off. You know, if you switch oh, yeah. your glass around enough, you're not gonna... It's mostly on the nose, too. Yeah. I mean, I don't really get it on the palate a whole lot unless it's been like, you know, you leave that in the sun for a week or two. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got a beer with a whole bunch of wild yeast that kind of like a funk, you know, a little funk to it, you know? I mean, it's... And, this, and, and uh, you know, and Sean, you're, you're a big proponent of swirling that yeast in the bottom of the bottle and pouring it into the glass, too. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Clear beer is cool, too. Uh, uh, the yeast can add texture uh, mm -hmm. to the beer. Yeah. Also, it's nice when like you're sharing a glass of beer with somebody. Like if you're going to open a, a bottle and, and share it with one, two, or you know, multiple people to get that yeast mixed up before you crack it open, because then everybody's enjoying the exact same glass of beer. You know. Uh, <laughs> inversion. The last guy that gets the yeasty pour, that poor guy. You know, everybody should. Have <laughs> <laughs> He's like, why is mine like a big cloud? It looks like a Northeast style IPA. <laughs> Which was subject. Kettle sour and Northeast style IPA, two popular subjects these days. So, um, you guys, 
maintaining a mixed culture. I mean, it's like if you look on the forums and if you look on websites, it's a huge, it's a huge thing that people now are interested in. You know, at home, um, keeping one, growing one. You know, what are what are some of the things that that home brewers or young breweries should be doing to maintain a culture and have a culture evolve with them as a brewery? Um, and that might be like a really long answer, but is there like a Cliff Notes version of that answer that you might have? Is there like a few like if you're gonna do three things, what are the best three things to do to make sure your your mixed culture stays happy? Because you know, yeast wants one thing, bacteria wants another, sac wants one thing, Brett wants another. I th I'd say like number one is just not overthinking it when yeah. it comes to like how you're gonna maintain it and just. Uh, like, if you overthink it, then you're you're probably going to be taking too many steps unnecessary that are going to, like, cause more harm than good. Yeah. The other thing is, like, I, you know, I don't know, it sounds a little crazy because we're making beers like this, and when clean brewers hear this, they're like, oh, yeah, that's funny. Sanitation. Um, is make, it yeah, it's important. It's an important thing uh, for making beer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, especially, you know, when we're making these stainless beers, obviously with oak fermentations, that's not – entirely a thing that's uh, possible uh, but yeah that and then also the timeline the mm -hmm. making sure that you're not having yeast sit around too long before you're pitching it uh, making sure you're not pulling it too early before you're pitching it um, just trying to get that that sweet spot of happy yeast going into the next beer is a good way of maintaining yeah I think that if I were to answer this I would all of the things that he said for sure like your your mentality about it is key right you're doing this for fun yeah. Whether you're doing it at home or commercially, you're doing this because you love this, right? So have fun with it. Don't freak out. Give yourself some freedom to experiment. Give yourself some freedom to screw up. Like oh, you're yeah. gonna, you know, we've dumped yeast before we've dumped beer before. Like it's inevitable. Embrace that. And once you kind of get over that, you can have a lot of fun with it. Uh, so that being said, like be experimental. Don't just try to prop up one thing, prop up three different things, maybe at the same time, maybe not different, you know, proportions of different organisms if you want, but try a few different things because, you know, you may have wasted six months trying to prop one culture up and you could have been trying to do three or four different things and you might have ended up liking something that you didn't expect you would have liked to begin with. So give yourself some freedom to play around. Um, yeah. I was going to say something else, but I forgot. Also, I think since you, but since that's what I was going to yeah. say, don't be afraid to like taste your yeast. Yeah, that's important. I've eaten yeast off the ground before here, so <laughs> seriously. And like, it's yummy. Kind of, you know, you're like, oh, this looks good. It should be creamy. It we smell. smell good. We smell and, and touch. You know, and, don't be afraid. Use all tasty. of your senses. Yeah. And that's you. I mean, that that uh, that is a big part of how we built the culture. Is, yeah. is those sort of. Uh, um, organoleptic, I guess is the word, mm -hmm. analysis of, uh, yeah. If it smells good, if it smells really pretty, it's probably going to make good beer. Mm -hmm. Probably. You got to take the risk. You got to take the risk, yeah. I'm going to see if I can't adjust this. Yes, thing. that's what I think. Yeah. Guys, yeah, oh. um, the, the willingness to experiment and play around with things. And, you know, I, again, I'm going back to the past interview, but Jeff calls you guys. Actually, this is when I was there. Jeff calls you guys. Glorified home brewers, yeah. which is really cool when you're sitting on so many barrels and uh, packaging and people expecting a certain thing when they show up to your brewery and all that stuff. It can be a lot of pressure for you guys to keep that mentality and say, This is fun. I mean, we're doing what we love to do. Uh, I had somebody, pretty on, awesome. I had somebody on a tour come by and showed them the whole facility, and then at the end, they're like, Is this it? <laughs> like where's yeah. like the other you know like your other yeah. facility where's your bottling line where's your <laughs> like all this like this is all that you have yeah we'll keep it small and fun and like try not to give in to any don't take pressure too seriously. yeah oh god yeah oh god oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> then you start making beer for the wrong reasons yeah so. yeah uh what what's uh your, what's your guys' favorite beer at that you've been a part of at Jester King and why? That's a good question. Um, well, the first beer I ever brewed on my own at Jester King, I think it was in the second week that I was working here too, was the batch that we used to blend Phantom Delray. <laughs> uh, 
And that, that beer sat in a tank for too long. Like four month, like four or five months in stainless stuff for to use in blending that beer. Um, so that beer has like a it's I don't know, dear to my heart in that way. I like the, I like the beer. I think it's really cool mm -hmm. too. Um, yeah, other than that, just like any time that we get to do uh, fruit refermentations, yeah. uh, because it's a really hands-on process. Uh, yeah. yeah, those are near and dear. Yeah, of the beers that we've released so far, um, Synthesis Analogous holds a special place yeah. in my heart. That was one of my first like pet projects. Um, I love sherry and fortified wines of all varieties, and uh, <laughs> and so we. We had some extra sherry casks, and we had tried doing like a secondary extraction on blackberries um, after fermenting nocturne chrysalis, and that secondary extraction was terrible. Uh, it was super tannic and crazy. We sent some of it to oak, um, but I blended quite a bit of it with uh, La Vie and Rose. So two parts, blackberry two is what we, we call it here, um, and then La Vie and Rose, and we added that to sherry casks. It's kind of a crazy beer. The sherry character is pretty strong. I think that the sherry will uh, continue to integrate with time in the bottle um, and also with decanting. I know it's kind of a strange thing to say, decant your beer, um, but I think that the sherry character is a little bit uh, less in your face when you've decanted the bottle. So I encourage people to do that. I've seen uh, many highly respected um, pub owners in Belgium use this uh, in the service of some of their barrel-aged beers and lambics. Um, but I would say that overall, what I'm most proud of that we've done here is the spontaneous beers. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working on that program for over four years now. And this past February, we're finally, uh, we finally did some blending and some packaging of these beers. So um, very, very excited for those to kind of reach the public and get everybody's feedback on that. So uh, been all of the brewing and all of the barrel stuff for that. And it's been a really amazing program to be a part of. And a few weeks back, we decided that we, well, we kind of already knew that we were gonna be re-fermenting this stuff with fruit as well. But uh, the fruit stuff that we have in tank right now with uh, the spontaneous beers, pretty great. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm pretty excited. To package that up next killer. week yeah. yeah so i want to talk about that because you guys i'm happy you brought it up again this is like you're leading me into my next point which is great this is spontaneous <laughs> fermentation um I, I, yeah, I was i was thinking in my head i'm like all right after this i'm gonna go this month but that cool ship that you guys have is awesome and it's so cool is the stained glass is there right next to it so it's like really kind of Romantic. Like a whole other place, you know. You got like some cobwebs, like you're in an old school farmhouse in Belgium, and the, the stained glass. But I guess if if I didn't know anything about beer, the person listening doesn't know anything about beer. You want to maybe kind of describe what you guys have up there, that cool ship, kind of how it works a little bit, and then maybe how you know what how you guys approach those kinds of beers. We approach them uh, very carefully. Very carefully, you know. Um, we try to take traditional, you know. So, what it, what are we most inspired by collectively here at Jester King? Um, old world saisons, of course, and spontaneously fermented beer from Belgium, lambic, goose, um, fruited lambics, etc. So, these are some of the beers that we would drink when we were making our beer here, and decided that we wanted to try our hand at it several years ago. Um, so out of supreme respect for those beers as they are now, that tradition as it has stood for so long, um, and out of even more respect for the people that are currently making those beers in Belgium, we wanted to adhere to a fairly traditional production approach. Uh, so pretty traditional grist, 60% uh, Pilsner malt, 40% unmalted wheats, raw wheat. Um, most of the wheat that we've been getting over the past couple of years has been Texas grown. Um, we acquire it through a local maltster here in the hill country called Blacklands Malt. Um, they're really great people and are making some awesome malt. Um, well water, so untreated water, aged hops. We're aging hops up in a horse barn here on the property. Um, so they're really mm -hmm. old and brown, and oxidized and cheesy and delicious. 
Um, they smell like a barn. They smell like a barn. Yeah. yeah. That's how we get, um, that's how we put <laughs> yeah. That's where we get all the farmhouse flavor. Yeah. That's how we put the barn flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Barn flavors. Um, barn. <laughs> um, what else? Yeah. So turbid mash, pretty traditional, hardcore, 14 hour brew day turbid mashing. Um, extended four hour boil. Um, knock out into a cool ship, no other heat exchange um, that we do, and then we'll leave it sit out overnight with the doors open, the windows open, um, allow that uh, ambient microflora, airborne microflora to fall into solution, spontaneously inoculating the work. We do not pitch any yeast at all whatsoever into that beer. Wow. Um, wow. We'll cut morning and we will recirculate it into a tank just to ensure homogeneous inoculation. And uh, then it goes straight to large format oak punch-ins for primary fermentation, where it will reside for one to three or more years, depending on the barrel. So you guys aren't pitching more yeast into it after you've inoculated it in the cool ship? Hmm. Very That's cool. The That's the most important part cool. about it, yeah. yeah. It's cheating, yeah. right? That's cheating? I mean, it's... Well, I mean, cheating is also pitching yeast is cheating. Yeah. And it's not spontaneous. It would, be, it would not be spontaneous. Yeah. Even all the way, so we pitch yeast in packaging of our other beers that are not our sponsor. So we're pitching yeast when we package. When we package these blends, we added no uh, no yeast as well. Oh, so really? Wow. Spontaneously fermented beers, no yeast, intentionally, only added by nature. Yeah. That's really cool. Really, really cool. I know a lot of people do this. They'll do like a pseudo cool ship where they'll like, you know, ferment it open and then they'll throw in yeast later in any ways and yeah. that's pretty awesome. That's and we, we've experimented with making that, uh, that, that sort of uh, process, but it's not at all part of our spontaneous uh, beer program. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just using the cool ship as an, uh, you know, an alternative way of cooling the work, maybe inoculating a little bit and then pitching yeast. Uh, cool. But not, but that's technically not spontaneous. Yeah. Cool. I think we have the right person sitting here to let us know potentially when we might be able to see those on the market. Uh, Where's <laughs> that? Um, I think that it's probably, it's pretty common knowledge. I think Jeff has been pretty vocal. Um, we're hoping to release it end of September, September, October time. So this fall is kind of the, our target. Um, Cool. So they will have been conditioning for six or more months in the bottle. Um, they taste really great already, so <laughs> we'll try to save some for you guys. Uh, I can't make any promises. <laughs> <laughs> we drink. We drink them. We're drinking them like <laughs> we've got five blends in there. Like so, we're yeah. trying once one a week. Five separate one. blends. So uh, I, I like how nervous you guys look when you're saying, "Yeah, we're drinking them." You know, they're all yeah. sorts of kind of. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. So I gotta. I want to. We're gonna kind of start wrapping up a little bit. We're into an hour, but I want to talk about a little bit about the new. Um, kind of going back to sense of place, but the new, growing on the farm, growing on the property, buying the whole property, going all out, planting. What kinds of things are you planting? What kinds of things do you guys want to grow? Um, how much, you know, there's like a brewery, Plan B, up in Hudson Valley, New York, where he's got a farm, and he's in, he's trying to do his own hops, his own grain, his own everything. How far are you guys going to take? Yeah, so um, when it comes to hops, it's the last thing you said, so I'm going to jump on that. Uh, growing hops in Texas is uh, very, very difficult. So while it's something that we've yeah. looked over the past years, they're mainly ornamental at this point. Uh, so we just recently purchased uh, about 58 acres of land here. Um, with the intention of basically preserving the land. Just being mostly about preservation of, of time and place and space time. The fifth dimension. Yeah. <laughs> and so preserving things in beer and also preserving the land here. Um, but, you know, we do a lot of fruit refermentation. So I think the main focus, at least in the, in the first couple of years, is growing uh, fruit for, for, uh, for our fermentation. So this year we planted uh, quite, quite a few. Quite a few really well out here in the country. Um, some plum trees and also blackberries. Uh, blackberries are doing very well this year um, with, with just their first year in the ground. Uh, we, we 
have been able to keep me sweating, which is nice. Um, some other Who's things. responsible for all that? For eating them? Who? Well, mostly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you guys, are you guys taking over the growing and responsibility of that? Or are you guys bringing people on that are growing this stuff? Or? We have people out that are focusing almost primarily on that. Um, we've got an amazing team of people that work in the tasting room that have got, you know, all kinds of other hobbies and skills and passions. And many of them, you know, they love this place just as much as we do. And they want to see it grow and thrive. And they want to contribute everything that they can. So we've got a lot of people from the tasting room. Um, that are coming out and helping, you know, weed the beds and trim the trees and, you know, water the plants and stuff. So that's huge. It really is a big family out here. And, you know, there are a lot of people that are stepping up uh, to help out with stuff like this. Um, that being said, it's a really big undertaking. And our engineering team, um, we've got a few guys that are really amazing and work super duper hard and have put a lot of thought into the planning of all of it. Uh, wastewater, you know, it's like a wastewater treatment plan that's kind of in the gestational phase, and so trying to implement that at the same time, and it's really just the overlap of a lot of projects, and we're all really excited about things, and so I'm trying to keep it organized and focused, you know. Starting small is, yeah. is a thing that, that's uh, it's important for us, uh, just within this first year, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we, we allocated about an acre uh, for the orchard. Um, and then next to that, uh, we'll be planting uh, some melons this year as well. Hopefully, that will maybe we'll be able to make a beer with them. Maybe not. We'll see. We're, you know, it's just kind of feeling things out this this first year, even two years is, is mostly what we'll be doing. See what works. See what doesn't work. Uh, get to know the dirt underneath us. You know, it's it's kind of a new thing for us to uh, growing things out here. Spend time out here to, to learn to grow things and to work with the land in the best way possible. Yeah, that's definitely something that we're excited about uh, moving forward is being able to to I don't know grow ingredients for the beer that we make here. That's really important. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, it's it's awesome and it goes in line with what you guys are trying to do, and it's it makes it just makes one hundred percent sense. Is there is there uh, one thing you guys are most excited about going forward for the next couple of years that uh, people like me would be very excited to hear? Well, I think just the, the spontaneous beers coming out. We're going to be doing new blends every year. Like Avery mentioned, the, the spontaneous fruit fermentations, which are just going to be uh, – that's a very special thing for us. I think uh, other people will agree once they get to taste it too. Um, yeah, those, those things that I'm really excited about. And also just being able to make petite prints every year. Just like we can yeah. do that. <laughs> as long as we can keep making petite prints, we'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ron. Is that Ron? That's Ron, yeah. Ron, you're not going to say hi? Come on, man. <laughs> Well, that's Ron's got big news too. Ron's moving to his own place. That's right. Ron, you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Is this being recorded? <laughs> it is right now. Live broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> you should schedule a chat with I'm Ron. not wearing my hat. You need to warn me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've literally been the endless man in this. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, they know you have your hat on. Well, they did until now. You're like, yeah. Uh, yeah, just really ruining the all of us. What's the guy from Home Improvement where you can only see like the top of his head? We're on the anti Wilson right now. This is the opposite. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's amazing, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, enjoy the <laughs> That was so good. <laughs> oh, man. Cool. I think that's the best way to end it possible. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to top that. That was awesome. <laughs> On that note, we've been talking about an hour now, and I think that, uh, you know, you guys have a life, and, um, I'm going to go probably to sleep, but you guys have a life. 
and you got to get back to that. So I'll let you guys go. But this was awesome. I'm really happy to see everything that's going on over there. Um, it was awesome to have an excuse to pop this bottle open and drink some more Jester King beer. It always puts me in a very happy place. Um, and thank you guys for your time. It's been a long time coming, but we finally got it done. And uh, cheers. Cheers.